Anthony Fauci says that virtual classrooms are better in parts of the country that are hard hit by COVID. So um, about face, kids are probably not going back to school. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll check into that tomorrow. But right now, um, we try to dig in with real doctors to talk about the real stuff. And Dr. William Schaffner joins us right now. He's a professor of medicine in the Department of Health Policy as well as Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine down in Nashville. And um, Doc, first I want to tell you that um, my good friend Consuelo Vanderbilt has uh, sat in and guest hosted with me many times. And uh, she is a uh, Vanderbilt heir and very proud of the Vanderbilt University. So thank you for all the great work you guys do down there. Um, the, the, I know you had told me a little earlier that hydroxychloroquine, in your view, is on the shelf right now. There's a lot of conflicting information out there. Um, anecdotally, uh, did you at any point ever think there may be some positive effects to hydroxychloroquine? Oh, sure, John. Right at the beginning, a lot of us were very intrigued. This is a very mm. interesting compound, a very interesting medicine. And in the laboratory, in the laboratory, it has two very provocative effects. Number one, it is an antiviral. It will actually interfere with virus multiplication in the laboratory. The other thing is, it in a strange way is an immunosuppressant. And it's used not only for malaria prophylaxis, uh, but also to treat people with autoimmune diseases such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. That's a function we don't entirely understand, but that also was thought to be perhaps useful in the treatment of COVID, particularly more severe COVID. Unfortunately, the rigorous prospective clinical trials have pretty much put hydroxychloroquine back on the pharmacy shelf. We're not using it at Vanderbilt at all because you can't demonstrate any benefit on the basis of rigorous controlled trials. So put the anecdotes aside, function on, uh, focus on the main science, and we've gone on to other things. And we have other drugs that can treat this infection now, of course. Got so, Doc, but let me ask you this. There are some doctors. There's actually one particular doctor that I know personally who said that um, he felt like it had some, uh, I don't want to call it healing effect, because I know that's not the right term, but he, he thought he saw um, accelerated uh, health, return to health from hydroxychloroquine. Um, if doctors are board certified and they feel like they know their client good enough and they think that this won't have, the adverse effects won't be, will, will not outweigh the benefits, why would the FDA come out and say, you cannot give this to people? I don't understand that. Well, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, we use anecdotes to initiate scientific investigation, not to draw conclusions. And once hydroxychloroquine, now in several really pretty well-designed clinical trials, has been shown to offer no benefit, then the, if you administer the drug to a patient, there's only potential harm, so there's no benefit to the patient. So it is. is it is almost. Harm. It don't. It, it is. If you. It, you know. I'm. I'm kind of like a libertarian, so it is kind of like nationalizing doctors because doctors are sworn to an oath that says do no harm. So if a doctor feels like they know their patient good enough and this will not do them harm, but it may do them so good, the government's taking that out of the doctor's hands individually to say, you can't make the right decision. We're going to make it for you. Well, we used to practice medicine that way back in the 1950s and 1960s. And since then, we've moved on from doctor's hunches to actually assessing in a rigorous fashion the evidence that underlies treatment. And so we practice evidence-based medicine today. And the trials have been done. You know, when you don't have the information, then you have to go with your feelings, your hunches. But when the data are in, then you're obliged 
to follow the data and uh, and and uh, practice rigorous evidence-based medicine. Understood. If that physician, hey. if that physician were taking an exam and wished to prescribe hydroxychloroquine for a patient with COVID, I'm afraid they would lose credit for that answer. Subjectively, understood. Um, I read this uh, study by uh, an Italian, um, I believe he was an epidemiologist, but um, they came up with this premise that they found a lot of the people that they had uh, uh, diagnosed with COVID uh, as their cause of death had um, their blood was kind of coagulated. And this doctor made an argument that it wasn't a virus at all, that it was bacterial. Um, and that the use of, you know, pushing more air into the lungs may have been actually had the adverse effect. Have you heard about this Italian study on viral versus bacterial? Yeah, so a couple of things. First of all, about the blood coagulation. We have learned, as we have taken care of more COVID patients seriously ill, that there is a propensity for this virus to stimulate the blood clotting mechanism, and you can have serious complications from that. That's now widely recognized. We anticipate it by doing the tests on the patients, and we can provide anti-clotting medication in order to prevent that. The other issue that you raise is also an interesting one, and the Italian doctor is onto something there. We too have noticed everything you can do to prevent the patient actually going on the ventilator is a good thing. We even put some patients on their tummies because they seem for periods of time so that they can breathe deeply Better. Right, right. Uh, and that hey, prevents the, the, Doc, the, the before we, before, the we run out of, before we run out of time, I just want to run this past you, and I'm a, I'm a layman, but I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Talked about how um, the multiplication uh, in the, in the uh, cells inside the lung lining um, caused an inflammation, which created less area inside the lung. And when there's less area and you're forcing more air in than the body is actually pushing in and out, that it actually had an adverse effect because it was causing trauma on the lungs because there was less area and more air being forced in there. Can you weigh in on that? Yeah, so the general notion is correct. The virus will actually destroy some of the lung tissue, and what you don't want to do is use the ventilator unless you absolutely have to. Of course, if the patient absolutely gets so sick that you have to, then we'll use it. It takes them a long time then for that inflammation to, to die down so we can get them off the ventilator. Once on, they tend to stay on for a long time. I so everything we can do to keep them off the vent is a good thing. Understandable. The Italian doctor was on to something. Yeah, and... Um I got to tell you, I'm a uh, Wall Street guy. I have absolutely zero medical uh, knowledge. I have a great doctor. Dr. Frank is my doctor. He's the best in the business. But I kind of just off the numbers, I read something that 80% of the people that went on a ventilator died. So just on the numbers, I'd try to get into, say, don't give it to me and let me be in the 20, maybe. Sure. Early data. We do much better than that in getting people off the vent now because we know more about how to treat these very seriously ill people. So right. we're doing better. Got it. All right, Dr. William Schaffner, thank you so much. You are fantastic. And we have to have you back again because uh, you put it into perfect terms for our audience to understand. Thank you very much. Good to be with you, John.